Yeah, that's out of Delphi. So I have COVID again. The first time I got it, I was like, not a problem. Daddy Disco can take this. And now the second time, I, 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 am, I am feeling like death. But I've taken the time off, and now I have all the time to read the uh, book along list. Uh, we're still going through those. I am now three and a half deep. Uh, and we're now going to talk about the second one I read, which is a book called Ninth Building. So from what I've read of the book along list so far, they've been kind of wild and they've made some really weird picks, um, just, just in terms of what they put on the list. And so far I've read Boulder, Ninth Building, the Maurice Cond book, and I'm halfway through that A System So Magnificent It Is Blinding, which is bullshit. I can't wait to talk about that. Um, but this second book, Ninth Building, is awesome and I love it. This is a book that feels truly its own animal. You read something like Normal People and Normal People is just a screenplay and then you see it as a screenplay and it's significantly better because all of this bland bullshit dialogue without quotation marks that this author has written in is just brought to life by actors and people and like passion put into it and then when you read it on the page it sucks. So that's a book that is not only a perfectly adaptable but necessarily adaptable and then you read Ninth Building and there is no way that it could be adapted. It is truly unadaptable because it is taking advantage of every possible part of the medium to kind of fuck with your head and uh, give you a unique experience. This is a book about the Cultural Revolution of China under Chairman Mao, I believe. And the book is taken in two parts and the focus is in two different places in both parts. In the first part, the focus is on them as children or the, the, the narrator as a child, whoever the narrator may be and he lives in this uh, ninth building, which is in Beijing, and he witnesses the Cultural Revolution where children are witnessing death daily, and they're turning in their parents, and they're being indoctrinated very young. And then the second half is the main character being taken off to the Great Northern Waste, which I took to be rural countryside, and him just kind of living with a bunch of boys in bunk beds, and then the revolution kind of very slowly and subtly creeps back in near the end. This book is kind of uh, nuts. It's crazy. I love the first half so much, so, so much, and then the second half droops a little bit for me. But overall, my experience is like profoundly positive, and it's a very unique book. I can't say I've read anything like it ever. It's, it's structured as a, a bunch of vignettes that occur, and apparently the author wrote them over a, a, a whole fuck ton of time, like 15 years or so. And you see the author's evolution from like a young kid, I assume, to an older adult. And that first half where they're in uh, Beijing and they're witnessing the Cultural Revolution is told so bizarrely, and it, it makes it... Uh, a realization of that shift, that cultural revolution, that you could never get otherwise. You could never show the the boring side of it and the kind of the sort of underconsciousness of it uh, without writing it like this. It's it's totally a, like it's got its finger on the pulse of what it's trying to do. There is an unbelievable amount of cultural reference in this. So much that went over my head. Probably like 80% of it I just didn't get. And that's what I want. Not to sound like a dumb Westerner, but if I'm reading international literature, I want to be seeing a world that I don't know. I don't just want to be reading a, like a Western book again. I don't want to be just be reading some shit that I could read in English. I want to be reading something unique. And Ninth Building gives me that in just absolute spades. It's awesome. A lot of it is like boring and pointless. And you'll read a story and you'll be like, what was the point of that? Why was that even in there? But that's the point, is that you're seeing these boring vignettes of daily life under the party, at least in the first half. And the author has this intelligent good grace to put the shadow of that over the whole thing. There's so many stories I can think of where it will start off mundane and then it'll shift into something really kind of grotesque and kind of off-putting. One of the, the, the thing that comes to mind with that is a story about a boy talking about his marble and lizard collection. And he's like, wow, I've got these really nice lizards. Wow, I've got these really nice marbles. Oh, my parents were detained yesterday. <laughs> and because they're children, they don't get the weight of it yet. So that's why it's written like that, is they're just talking about something boring, and then they're like, we saw a dead body on the side of the road. Oh, we witnessed soldiers murdering a woman. And that's like the point. It's like, because it's taken from the perspective of children, and the Cultural Revolution was about 
kind of indoctrinating children to turn them against their parents, at least that's what I've read, I, I don't really know, then it makes sense to tell it from the perspective of them and to show how that happened. The any or no comparisons come pretty quickly, and that's a fair comparison, because this really feels like Annie Erno rendered in fiction, at least in that first half. The second half feels more like it's told from the narrator's perspective, and then it then it, it becomes more like an autobiography. There are some details and idiosyncrasies to the to the Cultural Revolution and to culture in general that are so specific that it really puts you in the headspace and it really makes you feel like you're hearing this story from someone who knows it, who, who is, totally understands it. That's where the beauty and the strength of the book is, is in how real it feels. I'm not reading this book and going, wow, that was a great piece of writing. Wow, what incredible character development. No, I'm reading that and going, wow, that was a story about some young boys watching a couple having sex and then dobbing them in. <laughs> and that's and that's what it's about. And, it, and you're seeing a maturing of the writer's voice. And for whatever reason, it reminded me of um, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, just in the sense that it starts off really childish. And then by the end, the author is like very mature and very aware of what's happening around him. But in that, those first couple of chapters where the, it's, it's hard to tell what, if he's writing from his own perspective, or if he's writing from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, because the vignettes are so disconnected and the characters just don't repeat at all and it's and it's very hard to tell if that is a result of him implying things on different narrators or if it's just him the whole time and it has taken over such a long period of time even so there are some stories in the first half even though i'm saying that the 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 character development or the writing is not sort of stereotypically good there are some stories that stand out there's one about a um a handicapped person or a group of handicapped people that, that, that like stood out to me for whatever reason. One of the quotes was, I'd never met a disabled person with such heroism, which you know is, is probably what should go on my tombstone. Yeah, it was just so descriptive and the authorial voice was like so distinct and, and like uh, fun, um, which might not be the right word, but it really seemed like the author had this like dry wit about them that was that was helping in in these in these in these um, situations of writing it that it would just be too grim to write otherwise but because of the sort of smart sort of quippy way he's written it uh, it comes across a lot better many decades have gone by now but these people seem farther away still I think of them again but they've become false I have trouble convincing myself they truly existed and that's definitely part of it, is that if it, in the second half it becomes more apparent that it's being written from an older perspective, which just makes some of the narrator voice a little inconsistent and, and, and confusing. But when you're taking it as an older person reflecting on their childhood, that shadow has to be over everything. And that shadow has to take over some pretty reasonable, fun, core memories of yours. And you just have to be thinking more about the other thing that, that has ruined so many lives and it's just kind of sat like a parasite at the back of yours. How kids react to death in the book as well is, is very interesting. You can tell that they know it has some weight to it, but they don't really care or, or know what it means. I started to hate the ice-cold body lying on the ground. He'd left too much sadness behind him. And that's the point, is when you're indoctrinating children, the idea is to, conv like, they, they already don't have a good grasp of what has weight in the world and what, like, is, is important or dangerous. Um, and so if you're showing them other things that they could be doing, like dobbing in party members then and, and you're not telling them what the risk of that is in like real human terms then they're just gonna keep doing it and that's and that's why I, I liked the perspective this book had towards death where people would just die and it just didn't matter and it, and it was and it was totally relegated to the side while the narrator was talking about wow I saw this really cute girl today you know like that's what it is my 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 criticisms with that first half are very few just because it's so unique and it's and it's really pushing to have a, a weird effect on you, where you're seeing life in this tedious way through this really kaleidoscopic viewpoint. Um, but every now and again there was a moment of like writing flair that confused me. I, I remember that that first story, I think. There's a, uh, a moment where there's a paragraph where the author says, two bourgeois strike this in relation to a sentence, and I legitimately thought that was an editing mistake left in by the translator, but then it becomes a little apparent later on that that wasn't what that was, and it was like a moment of writing flair. But that was just confusing because I wasn't sure who the narrator was, so stuff like that was a bit annoying where I was like, uh, like if I was more aware of what the narrator voice was and like how, what kind of presence they had, that I would be more susceptible to this as like, and, and more willing to accept this as style and not just some, some like weird shit. 
or just a mistake. <laughs> the writing style does mature by about page 80. I believe the story is called Earn People and it's kind of right at the midpoint and the story feels a lot more self-reflective. It's using recurring metaphors. The boring stuff is more relative to his parents or the, or the author's parents, um, which implies that perhaps he's, he's feeling more of the connections there. And this is just before he gets sent away. So the, the idea that the writing voice matures there, where at the beginning it's kind of just waffling over some nonsense. I really like that. I really like that it ended in a different spot to where it began um, in that first part, considering how fragmentary it, it's written as. The last story of part one is this very sad nostalgic point to end the, the first half on, where the author is talking about growing castor beans and castor beans, I don't know what they are, I, I, have never, I, I have never grown one of those, but the author's going into great detail about how to grow them and how to make them take root, and then this is just an example of, a, a, like, the sort of childhood folly that, that he sort of relegates us to, and this is just the last example of that where he's like, this is what I'm growing in my garden, and then the very last line was, this was the fall of 1966, and most of our classmates were busy ransacking people's houses, putting up big character posters, forming themselves into units, linking up with other students across the country, marching in the streets, and the castor seeds no longer mattered. And what he has been describing in this story is more or less what the narrator has been describing all the way up to this point, which implied to me that it was either the narrator sobering up, not just in writing voice, but in kind of, like, uh, character, in, in the maturity of the, of the person itself, um, where they have come to realise what, what they have lived through. Uh, at least that's that sort of initial point. Yeah, the stories where he was a child are a lot more chaotic and scattershot, and I like them more. I'm more appreciative of them. And then part two settles into a rut, and it becomes a little boring. Sorry! Sorry! It becomes a little boring! Now, while part one is the story of Ninth Building, and the people living around it, part two, the narrator gets carted off up to... It's... I don't know what it was. It, I guess it was like some kind of farmland where a bunch of people lived in like a, a sort of a share house. It was like a bunch of, a bunch of um, people his age all living together in like, a, I guess like a, a, a kind of boarding school for farmers. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but um, he goes up to live there and he's on rural farmland and he sees the cultural revolution a lot less up there. And that's more to do with rural farm life. I don't know why it's in the book the way it is. If you're writing a book about the Cultural Revolution as a thing that happens, surely you want to write it more about the people in the city, right? And for the first half, it feels like he's hitting that political nerve that I wanted from the book, and then in the second half it just vanishes. He's just on a farm and he's talking about, we want to go back to Beijing, so we're faking our medical results, we're putting the thermometers in our armpits to like, warm them up and stuff like that, and it just, I was just like, so? Like, why is this, if it doesn't have that shadow hanging over it, why is it in the book? Yeah, a lot of that political commentary is gone for the second half. The part two stories felt a lot longer, and they felt a lot more pointless. I was getting way less out of them, and I, and I am slightly peeved that the book would, would kind of relegate me to that. It was very sad. As they become culturally separate from the revolution, and they're out of the city, obviously it's gonna have less of an effect on them. And that makes sense to me, but I don't know why we had to see that. I was more interested in seeing the the upfront effects of it. And I can imagine that it's it's probable that a lot of people had the experience of the writer where they were taken off to farmland as a way to escape that. That makes sense to me. Um, but I was just kind of left wondering what the point of it was when we're getting the same kind of story over and over of, and now we're farming again, and this weird thing happened, and now we're farming again, but now we're, we're gambling on the side, and I won the gambling this time, ah ha ha. Um, you know, it was like, okay, like, why does this matter? And a lot of that I remember a lot less of than the first half, which really sticks in my mind. There was one philosophy that the writer ended a lot of his stories with in the second half, and it was more like, this person is dead, and without the memory of them, they never truly existed. And that was like every second story would end like that, and that got very funny. It got very cringe that that was like the, the point that the author kept making. Eventually, the frozen outer shell had nothing to support it and collapsed, crushing two educated youths from Beijing, both girls. I didn't feel very much when I heard about this. When I think of it now, though, I realize they were just 17 or 18. They never loved, never truly lived. Like, that was a little cringe, talking like a fucking secret history character. By about halfway through part two, the book becomes a lot more descriptive and poetic and vivid, and it struck me at that point at how far it had been since the first half, where you're watching kids like running around and dubbing in their parents and watching grandmas kill themselves and stuff like that. And, and it struck me how far we'd come, but it felt really redundant. It felt like 
just scraps of poetry and it felt like really unimportant that he was putting that level of detail into de describing how the plants were growing and stuff like that. By the end, the revolution creeps back in again and it was almost to the point where I was ready to forgive it all because I got the point of it where it was like, oh, suddenly a soldier's appearing. Oh, that hasn't happened recently. Oh, we found a couple that have died in our basement who have run from the revolution. That's interesting. You know, stuff like that. And I was like, oh, it's almost there. And then it disappeared again. And I was like, what the fuck? And then, yeah, so it, 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 it's really in the background. It's so far in the background that it's almost not existed in the second half. Um, and I was kind of left wishing for more um, detail and more um, intensity to it. But if he's describing an experience that a lot of people had, including himself, then I can probably forgive him for that. By the end, the writer gets very wistful and worried about death, which I appreciate. I wasn't sure why it went to that, <laughs> like, the way it did, but it, but it, it kind of made me smile that it, it had gone for that. And I was like, oh, okay, shit, it's, it's, it's going for that kind of vibe, is it? No more drinking. If I keep drinking, those eyes will be everywhere. Turn off the lights. Look, I'm crying. Please don't laugh at me. <laughs> that was quite a grim sort of moment um, where his memories kind of shift to the present and he realizes, I guess, how much he regrets or how much he saw. I don't know. His writing voice is very hard to, to, to take from. It's a very weird book. It's very hard to describe. The last five pages or so I really like, which is him kind of explaining why he wrote it, or at least why he wrote the second half. And I won't necessarily say why he did that, because I, I thought that was a good way to end it. It came at like a good moment. And I thought it was quite powerful. And it, it, it the afterword made me nod and I was like, that's good. Like it ended really strongly, um, where it kind of reflected back. And you, you realize that you've seen the entire life of a man living through the Cultural Revolution with gaps and all, and the gaps he's just filled with like some stuff about I'm growing this, and I was I was bored at that point, but so was the author probably. So yeah, it makes sense that it's structured like that. One of the lines of the afterword made me nod. Everyone has a vast book in their heart. It's beginning very far away. The wise do not read it out. You mundane and hollow spend your savings. I really liked that, and it and it made the author feel um, very kind of powerful in how little they mattered to everything, in how they were just a witness to everything. And that's the point, um, is that even though he's critical of himself for writing it, kind of, or he's kind of unhappy with what he's seen, um, and he, he has spent his savings, um, he has told us something that's very uh, unique and odd, and I, and I, again, I have not read anything like it. And then, and then at the end there's a bunch of poems that are like fucking... Dr. Zhivago, and I just thought that was self-indulgent, I really didn't like that. Um, and it, it, it just felt pointless. Like, I, I'd read all that already, I'd read all that poetic stuff already, he didn't have to put it in a different way. Part 1 just went absolutely insano style, and I'm begging anyone who's like speed reading through the book a list to please read just the first half. It's cooked, I love it. It's a little repetitive at the end and kind of unnecessary. If the first half is about the Cultural Revolution and it locks you in this super awesome a specific headspace, then the second half loosens its grip in a way that I really wish it didn't. But yeah, I really enjoyed this book. Um, I, I, once it was done, I had no idea how to rate it, um, but I really enjoyed it. The book is translated by someone who was on the judging panel for last year's International Booker, and when I read that I went, there's no way that could win. It can't win. If it was translated by someone who was on the judging panel last year, I don't see how it can win. If it does, that's very funny, and immediately people will be like, Duh, what the fuck? But I, I don't know, I mean, it's a, it would be a cool winner. It would be a crazy winner, I would love it. It would be an awesome pick. But would it win? <laughs> Personally, I think that if it makes the shortlist, then it's definitely gonna win. Uh, because that means that they don't care about the it's rigged argument. And as I was reading it, I thought, if that fucking Tomb of Sand book can win, then this can absolutely take it, because this is totally something that feels like it'd be up their alley. Um, and it's something that's so unique that it's very hard to criticize. <laughs> I'll be super pleased if this ends up on the shortlist. Of, of the three and a half that I've read, this is my favorite. Um, and I think it'd be a really good pick to put on that list. Um, and if, if other people read it, I, I would, I'm dying to hear what they think about it. Anyway, yeah, I really enjoyed this. It had crazy lightning flashes of just fuckery, and then the ending was a little bit of sort of dredging to it. But I'm left thinking abstractly about this book with this just crazy grin of pretentiousness on my fuckhole face. This book has like 50 ratings on Goodreads, so if you've read it, you're an absolute hipster, and you should tell me what you think about it in the comments. So thanks for watching, lads. Have a good one.